Two years ago, my body started a problem with gravity. I mean, um, as a futurist, I always found gravity overestimated and overrated. But, um, you know, long sitting in trains, long sitting in cars, in airplanes, and whatever, on conferences like this. So, I developed a slip disk. And some of you have the experience or can imagine what it is, how it is, if you have horrible pains all day long, all night long, and what it makes with the brain who wants to think. So in the end, I had to go to the hospital and remove a delicate part of my body in my spine. And in doing so, in preparing it, I suddenly realized I wanted to meet my surgeon. Not only to meet him, I wanted to talk to him. I wanted that he explain to me how it is and how he would do, how he would manage to cut me open five millimeters away from the spinal cord and all the nerves who would make my down the side of my body moving. I wanted to be a friend with him. So I really met him and he told me a lot about his life, how he came to Austria 30 years ago, 34 years ago in the Iranian revolution and how he built up his profession and how he still likes to operate. I asked him, do you really like this, cutting people open? What are you doing there? And he said, yes, I really like it, because if I succeed, something gets better. And I really like this idea of um, being in a contact to him. So the things went out quite well. I really woke up again after the operation. I didn't expect this, but, but <laughs> it worked. And uh, the wound healed quite well. And had it something to do with the fact that I've met him, that I became nearly friend with him. I invited him to my garden party. We still are in contact. So what does this little story mean? It makes a question. Did it have anything to do with my healing process? Did he heal me? No, he didn't heal me. He just removed an obstacle of my personal well-being. So what do I want to tell you with this story? I think that medicine is always, in a way, about relationships, about connections between people. And what did we hear today, and what do we always hear, what medicine needs in the future? Basically, more and better pills. We already have, like you all know, a lot of pills in the business of medicine. We need more genetic technology, individualized medicine is necessary in the future. We need more data more artificial intelligence. We need more money in the system, much more money. Everybody asks for money. And care robots, maybe also that. And that everything of these parts of the future of medicine might be right, but I think they are not enough. And in my 25 years of coping with the future, of thinking about what will happen, I realized that we very often can't distinguish between the new and the better. A lot of the colleagues of myself, futurists, are coming onto stages all over the world and telling you new things. And our neotonic brain, you know, our brain wants to know the new, is mesmerized, is fascinated, and he thinks that the new must be the better. But this is not always the case, like we know. So if we want to think about the future of medicine, we shouldn't only think about technology and money and care robots. I think we should about talk about systems. We should understand the differentiation or the distance between two different things, healing and repair. We are talking about the health system. But is it really a health system? No, it's a repair system. And how can we get this a little bit more together, healing and repair, so that we really can call the health system a health system and not a repair system. I think health has a lot to do with different factors, with social factors, but also with energy factors. Life is energetic, 
And health is a term in the middle of the life energy we got from evolution. And this is why we invented in a study some years ago the expression healthness. So to just develop healthness in a society or as an individual, we have to understand that our system of health lifelong is driven by different tensions of energy. Our life energy is not constant. It goes up and down over the age of our, of our, bi of our biography. Our self-expectation is different from the expectation which society or our friends or our social surroundings have on us. And diseases or frictions are happening in these kind of very specific parts of our biography where this all doesn't fit together. And this is basically creating a history of our diseases lifelong, which can lead to better or less life energy and life quality. So how could we implement the idea of a kind of relationship medicine to the whole system? In America, where you have probably the most complicated, not complex, but complicated, this is a big different health system of the world, which is not really functioning, it's very expensive and not very effective, they try experiments, they are making experiments with concierge medicine. And concierge med medicine means that you have a person, mainly it could be your practitioner, could be one doctor of your trust, which leads you through life. And they are trying to professionalize it so that it's not so expensive like it, you could think in the first beginning. You know, Because if everybody would act like I did with my surgeon, probably the, the healthcare system would, complete, would be completely broke. But you can do it quite professionally. For example, forward medicine. Forward medicine is a kind of experimental startup where you once in your life come to a doctor's team, you are scanned, you are screened, all your data about your body and probably your life circumstances are um, digitalized, of course, and then you can live a happy life on a long string. So always when you feel that something is wrong with your body or even with your soul, you can contact some uh, person in this team. That is not as expensive as it looks. It's a kind of meta system in the health system which guides you through all the excess you need when you come into the situation that something really goes wrong. And the idea of it is that you get healed before you get sick. And if you have to need a doctor, if you have to meet a doctor, then it should be longer. It should be more intensive, and you should have all the time you need. Another example is Parsley Health in San Francisco. It's another startup in this way. And they are working with practitioners and another kind of design in the different spots and locations you are going to um, to get a better health. Or think of Burzog in Holland, client-centered care, founded by Joost de Bloch, and he thought, you know, digitalization is very important also for all these ca caring people we, um, who, who, are, who are looking after people at home. But what is really happening is that if you professionalize it, on a certain level, then you have suddenly 25 people in a week coming and ringing on your doorbell. Everybody's doing something different. Someone is giving you the pills, someone is changing the bed sheets. And that is not really a state of connectivity, of connection to people. So he invented a new care system which pulls the pyramid of care from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. He completely um, makes the person who needs care into the middle point and creates a system of self-organization of care. So that means this thinking is the other way around. It's not the offerings of a health, a professional health system, which is deciding what you have to do and you have to fight for access to it. It's putting the me, the person, into the middle of the system and at different players. That's systemic thinking turned over to the health system. 
And it works also on the level of societies. If you have trust societies, like the Scandinavian countries, where you have a little bit a different worldview about what the government can do and what you should do, also about self-responsibility, digitalization is much easier. And they are creating now a new system of health called the Danish, Danish strategy. They built new hospitals where they have only one bedrooms with one sleeping place. Of course, you can change the walls if you want. And a seamless system of coordination in between the different factors of the health system. And I think we are talking about designs always, of, of the, always as a kind of exterior shape, a form of the outside, but that's not the case. So this is the hospital I always see on the outskirts of Vienna when I jog in the morning. It's the AKH, the Allgemeine Krankenhaus, and I always compare it with Darth Vader's Death Star. And I promise myself, I don't want to be there. I don't really want to be there. It might be very efficient, but not effective for health. It's efficient maybe in repairing, but not effective in health. I, and I think these two different wordings, efficiency and effectivity, are very, very important. So you can do it in, in a different way, and it doesn't have to be more expensive. And it needs another idea of healing. Maggie Keswick was a cancer patient who wrote a, a wonderful book about how you l lost you can feel in the neon light waiting for radiation or for all the treatments you have to undergo when you are a, a patient, a cancer patient. And she founded a, a public-private partnership where architects worked for free to make these kind of rehabilitation centers for women with cancer. And they, you find them now in, in every bigger town in, in, in England, and they are quite well known. Or think of Hogaway. Hogaway is a, a care center for Alzheimer patients, but you are not, it's not about restricting what you do. You know, normally it's about fear that people do stupid things. You know, they run out of the center, uh, they don't take their medicine. It's about the no-goes where normally these kind of facilities are working at. And in this, in Hogaway, it's a little bit different. You can be mad in your own way. And it's called validation. The therapy they use is validation. So if you go with someone in his own world, where he starts to forget things, but other things are getting much more clearer in your life, that can be a very touching thing. And it takes away the fear of this disease. It's also called hypersanity. Hypersanity is an idea which was invented by the psychologist Ronald D. Lang in the 70s or 80s. And he said, some madnesses are not madnesses. They are just reactions to life. And they are trying to, state, to come into a state of resilience where what you do and how you feel is the best thing you can do to get yourself into balance. And there... Now I'm back to sanity. What is it? It's basically a balanced system. You can be sane without a lag or with missing things in your life, but you have to be in, to in, in a own responsibility of your balance into a living system of your biography. So what we need is a very professional, efficient heating and repair system which is held together by a connected society. I think people need the connection to a better world. And people need the connection to a higher complexity, of a higher integration of the systems we are confronted with in our life, and we created ourselves in a technical civilization. And the perspective of it would be holistic, health system, where all these three parts of life are coming together. Or we could also say the utopia we are longing for is a kind of health society, the society where health becomes contagious. Thank you very much.